Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very, very, very special guest. Our guest is Guy Gain, and he is an amazing person. He is an author, a speaker, a life coach, and he has an amazing story to tell that really brought him to the point he is today. He is a remarkable man with an inspirational story that has turned people's lives around, and he's here today to share his story, to share who he is, and hopefully his story will inspire you and help you in your own life. So Guy, it's a pleasure having you on the show. I'm honored to have you on the show. And you know, tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do. Sure, thank you for having me. Uh, I uh, was a stockbroker in my life. Um, I, uh, when I became uh, uh, involved in the financial field, the Dow Jones was at 577. So I'm dating myself going back those many years. But uh, in today, um, today the market is actually uh, rocking and rolling. But um, in any event, um, I was a broker for many, many years and had my own firm. Um, I had uh, multiple offices nationwide and uh, went along with that for uh, quite a few years and uh, decided that um, toward the end of my career, I was going to semi-retire and turn the business over to my family. Uh, I had my children work for me as well. And um, I decided that I would start another company uh, with two investment bankers, and uh, we were going to do a real estate investment trust. And I'll get into the story as to why I decided to do that. But um, uh, during the years that I was a broker, uh, and I think that this is really important, especially for anybody that's in sales, you know, there's there's the good times and the bad times. And sometimes the highs are very high and the lows are way too low. And right. sometimes you you just stick, get stuck in a valley. And I think it's important to know that just keep going on. I think that within a year or two, you know if this is the career for you, whether it's being a broker or an insurance agent or a car salesman or whatever it is, you know, yeah. people tend to look at salespeople as, um, uh, I don't know, maybe second rate people because they can't do anything else. You know, every single thing, Stacey, that we have, whether it's clothes or, you know, hair gel, whatever, somebody right. had to sell that to the store or to the, to the consumer. And I think it's, it's, as I say to people, when I deal with them as a coach that, you know, I, my, my, really, my focus is to uh, 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 stockbrokers and to um, insurance agents because I can relate to those. I know exactly what they're going through. I know what I went through and it doesn't really change. But right. as I say to them, it's a very, very sacred trust because these people that you're dealing with, these clients that you're dealing with are trusting you to do the best thing for them. And yeah. uh, kind of my story, um, what had happened is uh, when we, um, when I started this, uh, this new company, uh, we started raising money for our existing company uh, and the reason being so I could continue to pay my employees and so on. But what had happened in 2003, uh, well, let me back up, actually. When I, I was not only a stockbroker, but I was a registered investment advisor. And as a registered investment advisor, that allowed me to really manage my clients' accounts in a way that I couldn't do as a broker. Stockbrokers, as you know, uh, Stacey, can, they, they buy and sell stock. And there's a commission when you buy there's a commission when you sell. Actually, there's a joke in the in brokerage community. Two brokers see one another and say, hey, hell, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. How are you doing, Jim? Oh, I'm doing great, too. Uh, how are your clients doing? Well, they're not doing too good. You know, and the thing is, is that, you know, because the broker is always making money. Actually, there was a, a movie that you probably had seen, uh, Trading Places, and uh, came out many, many years ago. And it's still a classic and it's still funny. But uh, when they're trying to explain to uh, the, the kid that they just hired, uh, how they uh, how the company makes money, they kind of make a joke about that. Well, we buy and we sell and we make money both ways. But what right. I had decided to do was to charge my clients a fee to deal with me. And even though I could never promise anyone that they could make a profit, if I was charging them a management fee to deal with them, I could promise them that I would never charge them a fee until I make them money. So I charged a 2% fee for anything under 500000 and that number just went down as the uh, numbers went up. But um, what I did is I told them on a year-to-year -year basis, I always had to make more, and they had to be satisfied, certainly, but I always had to make more than they had the previous year, or otherwise it would continue to manage their money for free. And um, so I had skin in the game. So if the client made money, I made money. If the client didn't make money, I didn't either. 
So the thing is, is that as the years went by, uh, I was I was dealing with millions and millions of dollars. But what we came to find out in the early 2000s is that a lot of the big money managers, the people that were managing billions of dollars, I was just a paltry guy with millions, but uh, the guys that were dealing with billions of dollars were actually uh, trading after hours. And I know, Stacey, you're familiar with the markets. Uh, the stock market, as most people know, is open between 9.30 and 4 o'clock. It's been like that for many, many years now. Uh, but what was happening is these big money managers were being allowed to trade after hours, after 4 o'clock, actually up until 8 o'clock as it, it came to be um, known. Well, that was an unfair advantage because they were doing things that the average uh, investor couldn't do. Uh, the reason that some of the big uh, mutual fund families were allowing that is because they wanted that business. So they were right. allowing this to go on. Once they had found, Once the government found out about that, uh, there was uh, some real internal problems that went on in the brokerage industry. So for about two years, as they were uh, re-regulating and redoing everything, uh, they eventually found that they were not going to allow people like me to trade all every day. And that's what I did. Um, I would, uh, when, a, when the markets were strong, yeah. I had to make sure that people's money was invested. When the markets were showing weakness, I tried to have their money sitting in a money market account. Nobody's ever going to pick the high or the low. But my whole theory was that I would rather take a small loss than a big loss. And um, anyway, what happened in 2003, uh, the um, uh, industry was changed where now I could not trade every day. And by the way, there was no fees, no charges to do that. I made yeah. anywhere in average uh, per year between 70 and 90 trades a year. No fees, no charges for that, no commissions. Um, but in any event, that all changed in 2005. And I had to really make a decision. What am I going to do? I have all of these employees uh, and, and I'm going to have to let people go because it's taken my business away. Yeah. Well, one day I had a place up in Maine on the beach and I was walking along the beach one day feeling pretty bad. This was in August of uh, 2005 and really contemplating what was my next move. So I started thinking about a real estate investment trust, and I, I had looked at a house there that I had looked at some years previously that was for sale again. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at it, I thought, well, you know what? It's probably worth more than what it was when I looked at it a few years prior. And as I kept walking along, and it was kind of a, one of those dreary days, uh, not only emotionally, but you know, um, out in the weather too that day. Yeah. And I started thinking, well, you know, if you have a, a, a property along the water, it's never going to lose value. I kept right. walking. I thought, well, you know, the ocean and, you know, it's, the, the real estate in Maine is less expensive than it is, let's say, in Florida. Right. And then I thought, well, if you hit property on a lake, it's going to be worth more. Property on a canal is good. So I started thinking like that. And I thought, you know what? This would be a good idea to put my clients into something like that. At least give them the option because I can't manage their money anymore. Right. I went back to my house and I pulled up what I was hoping to find on the on the Internet a real estate investment trust that dealt in waterfront property. And I was stunned because there were not. And the more I looked at that, it, I, I didn't come up with this idea. I'm not, not that brilliant. And the more I looked, the more I, I, I couldn't find anything. So when I went back to my main office, which was in Buffalo at the time, um, I talked to some of my other folks there and said, hey, what do you think of this idea? And Stacy, everybody loved it. I talked to two investment bankers and uh, that I had been referred to. And yeah. they love the idea as well. So we decided to put together a new company. But while we were putting that new company together, we started raising money for our old company so I wouldn't have to lay people off. And um, as we started bringing in more money, I made a mistake and allowed my brokers to bring in money as well. One of my business partners at the time said, well, you know, we should pay them a commission to do that. And, you know, all of us have, I'm, I'm not saying all of us listen, but all of us have that still small voice. And yeah. that still small voice told me that day not to do that. And of course, I didn't listen. Uh, I listen to it now all the time. But at that point, I didn't. And anyway, uh, a few years went by. And uh, it took us longer to put the real estate trust together than we had hoped. In the meantime, I found out that uh, found out too late, actually, that a few of my brokers were lying to our investors. And when they got caught, they decided, well, you know, and I understand because drowning men will drown the people that are trying to save them. Uh, I found out that they had uh, got their story straight. There was three of them, actually. Uh, and when they got their story straight, to tell, tell the government that I told them to do that. I instructed them to lie. 
And uh, that, of course, was just not true. The government came after me. I became the target of the U.S. Attorney's Office in Western New York. And uh, I fought with them for, for years that I didn't do this. That's not true. I even passed a couple of polygraph tests. I passed one that was the traditional uh, wired up one. And I also yeah. passed a voice stress analysis, which I understand that the FBI and the CIA routinely use, or at least they did. In any yeah. event, the thing is, is that I passed them both. But I still ended up going to, um, to, to uh, well, I was going to go to trial, but I ended up uh, going and uh, asking for a plea uh, a few years later because I found out that had I gone to trial and lost, uh, I would have gotten a lot more time than I ended up getting. And yeah. um, it was kind of funny because when, uh, you know, when, when all of this was going on, uh, I just kept thinking well, the, the truth is going to set me free. Like the Bible says, I'm going to be fine. Of course, I didn't really believe that because I kept visualizing, oh my God, what if I go to prison? What's going to happen? And you know, what's going to happen? By this point, the government had frozen all of my assets. I had no money left. Uh, I couldn't even get a, a, a paid attorney. Uh, they would not release the money for me to do that. And right. I ended up with a public defender. And that's all I kept hearing from him is you got to plead, you got to plead. Well, when I finally got indicted uh, some years later, uh, they threw 51 counts at me. I thought, 51 count? Where were they get? Well, I came to find out that the more counts that you get placed on you, the weaker the cases that the um, that the prosecutor has. And you only need to be found guilty at trial on one count. And they can throw the book at you as if you were guilty on all of them. Oh, so yeah. in any event, I ended up pleading. And uh, when I went for sentencing, uh, a, a year later, um, the judge threw the proverbial key, uh, key away and he gave me 13 years. Um, it was devastating. And I thought, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Uh, when I finally uh, um, um, uh, reported to prison a few weeks later, um, when I walked into that block, Stacy, I thought, this is impossible. I can't. I, how am I going to do this? You know, we all talk and have heard about, well, I broke my heart or my heart was broken. I can tell you that my heart actually broke when I went, went out of that block. I was on the block with 150 other people and the, the, the noise, the mayhem, the screaming, the swearing, it was, I, I isn't even talking about it. I, I see it because I remember that. And yeah. I, I ended up reporting in, in uh, October of 2011. Well, the years went by and uh, I decided that I can't stay like this forever. I can't be a broker anymore. And my license had been taken away and I have to do something. And uh, so many people, as we know, give up. And I understand, I do. You know, life throws us, not they don't throw curveballs. They throw rocks, boulders, and it buries a lot of people. But I wasn't yeah. going to be that person. And, you know, when I went to prison, Stacy, I found that the people that, that go to prison are either the predator or the prey. And even though I had been a weightlifter for many, many years before I had gotten in trouble, uh, yeah. I had laid off for a few years prior. And I decided that after, especially after what I see was what was going on in prison, how people were being picked on and more, uh, yeah. I decided I'm going to get back into the weight room. And that's what I did. So I ended up losing a bunch of weight while I was in prison. Uh, I became very, very strong. I was never going to be the strongest guy on the compound. But I remember thinking to myself, I am not going to certainly never be a predator, but I am definitely not going to be the prey. And even though I was not a guy that was going to be able to beat up the big guys in there, I would be enough trouble to take down that I wasn't worth the time for somebody to come at me. Now, be, that being said, I had a lot of credibility during my years in prison, and I was very, very fortunate because I only got into a mix up a few times, but I did get into a mix up a few times. And, um, you know, I walked away from it. You know, I could walk away from it. We'll leave it at that. But in any event, the thing is, is that as the years went by, I decided I, I needed to do something. So I thought I'm going to start writing. And I had been, I had wanted to write a book for many, many years and just really never had the time or made the time really. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, in prison, I had a lot of time. So after I would get done at work, uh, I would, uh, I worked in the chapel while I was there most of the time while I was in prison. But uh, after I got done there, I would get in the weight room and, and do my thing there and uh, I was also very active in the church in uh, in prison, and I'm a piano player. So when they found out that I could play the piano, uh, I became the music minister for the prisons that I was at. I was at four different ones uh, during my time. And then uh, um, I, I started writing. And uh, the books that I wrote, I mean, I remember the, the, the one book, and I'm going to just maybe just show you this. Hopefully you can see this. 
It's called mm -hmm. Dark Chrysalis, Awakening to God's Path, Protection, and Power in Your Life. And this book actually um, is um, a, a book that's an inspirational book using the words that Christ himself used about not giving up, not doubting, to always have faith. And, you know, over and over, Jesus talked about that in the Bible, that, you know, we needed to believe. And there's so many inspirational stories in the Gospels that 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 happened that proved that with God, all things are possible. Well, I, I, I mentioned this because as I was writing, it wasn't me, and I know this sounds hulky, it wasn't me that wrote that book. I wrote about 20% of the things that I looked up. But as I was writing, it was these were these were thoughts that were coming to me, and I don't don't, don't please don't confuse me with you know some uh, you know biblical figure that uh, like Paul who had been in prison writing you know some of the gospels or some of the epistles, um, but I remember when I would look back at it after I, I I wrote it, and it took me two years to write by the way, um, I would think wow this is a pretty good idea, and you know even today when I look at the book, you know it, it's the parts that I wrote I I remember. But there's a lot in this book that I don't remember writing because it wasn't me. But the thing is, is that um, uh, after I had written the book, and as I said, it took me a couple of years to write, uh, yeah. I ended up writing another book as well about my prison experience and about, you know, weightlifting and how to get strong and, you know, all of those different things. And that particular book that's called Unchained and Unbroken, Life Lessons and Strength Training from a Jailhouse Gym Rat. And the reason I wrote that is I didn't want to really get graphic about all of the terrible things that went on in prison. But I wanted to talk a little bit about that, about my experience as a broker. And also for those folks that had thought about getting strong and thought about working out, uh, I put together this book that goes from the very, very novice to somebody who's been weight training for many, many years. And um, the book is very, very popular as well. When I came out of prison, I'll just mention that to finish that, uh, the author uh, a part of my life, I wrote another book called Managed Money, An Avenue to Wealth. And um, that book is really about, it's an e-book, uh, by the way, uh, but that book is about managing your own funds, about managing your own investments, and really how I did it and still do, uh, because I have a, a subscription uh, service that I do a, a weekly newsletter uh, that uh, is a market update and tells people what they can do with their money. Um, but in any event, uh, I decided to write that when I came out of prison. But all three of those books are available on Amazon as well. But, uh, you know, I seen how God had my back in prison. And I know, again, that it sounds maybe corny to some people. But, you know, when people go to prison, the, the, the urban legend is everybody finds Jesus and gets tattoos. Now, does that happen? Yeah, it does happen. But not anywhere near the amount that people think it does. Yeah. And for me, my faith was what really kept me going. Because I seen over and over and over how God had my back. And if I could share a story. Mm -hmm. When I first went to prison, they don't tell you when I say they, I mean the, the, the staff, the administration, they don't tell you the ins and outs of prison. I mean, when you're a, a guy that's not a street guy that, you know, you, this is not on your radar that you're going to go to prison, you don't have really anybody that you can talk to that's going to tell you, well, this is what happens in prison and this is what you need to do. So you kind of find out the hard way. And yeah. um, I had only been there a couple of days and I went to call my wife one night and uh, it was about 11 o'clock. Now, I, I got to tell you it uh, this way. The phones in, in the federal prison, and I think it's the same in the state, but I know in the federal system, the phones are closed off at 1130 p.m. And they don't open up again until 6 a.m. the next morning. Now, you have to wait generally an hour between phone calls. And in the federal system, they give you either 10 minutes to talk or 15 minutes to talk. Most of, most of the facilities allow you a 15-minute phone call, but then you have to wait an hour. Well, as I was dialing my wife, it was 11 o'clock at night this particular night, and I'm dialing the phone. Well, I happened to see a phone off the hook. And I thought, well, you know, being the gentleman <laughs> that I was, I'll just be a nice guy and hang it up. Well, as I was dialing, this big guy, who the, you can imagine the expletive there, hung up my yeah. phone. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I just got here. I said, I did. Why, you son of a, he went ballistic. I thought, I'm dead. I I'm dead. I mean, this is the, all of the stories that I've heard I'm about to, to experience. So I went back to my my cube and I thought, I'm, I'm dead. I don't know what I'm going to do. And this poor guy, what had happened is he had gone back to his cube. I, I just one of the things I didn't know. A lot of guys will, you know, put the phone down for a second, run back to their cell 
part of their cube and get a, a pen and a piece of paper because they need to write something down. Well, I just hung up on this guy. And remember now it's 11 o'clock. He can't make another phone call until the next day because the phones turn off at 1130. Yeah. He's livid. So I don't know. I went back to my cell I, I, or my cube. I didn't know what I was going to do. And finally, I, I thought I, I got to go see if I can see this guy and maybe diffuse this. I didn't think I could. So there's a, um, rooms in the prisons that are called day room. Uh, and, and what these are is this is where the TVs are. And, um, uh, you know, when I walked in there, it was a Saturday night. Uh, yeah. I had just been there a couple of days, as I said, but um, I walked in there and the room was full. There had to be 50 or 60, maybe there were more, but at least there were 50 or 60 people there. And he's sitting there and he's spread out in his chair, you know, his legs are out. He's fuming. I went up to him. I said, I am really sorry. I didn't know. I, well, he ripped me apart again. A couple of days later, and I thought, I'm, I'm dead. Yeah. The next morning, Sunday morning, I, I, I was getting ready to go to church. And um, uh, he comes to my cube. I don't know. This is it. He said, I am really, really sorry. He said, you had no idea what was going on. And I shouldn't have said what I did to you. Now, I'm trying to be mag magnanimous at this point. Oh, it's okay. You're fine. Don't, don't worry about it. You know, but a couple of days later, I went back into their TV room and the TV rooms for people that don't know are really ground central for problems in, in the prisons that I was at anyway, because what happens is a lot of guys will sit in chairs that don't belong to them. Everybody in prison seems to have a space. And the longer you've been in prison, you get to claim that space and you better not sit there. Or at least if you do, you better ask permission if you can. A lot of guys don't. And there's it's where the fights ended up starting. So this particular day, a couple of days later, was a Monday. Uh, I went in there in the afternoon and I seen this young guy sitting there. I said, do you mind if I sit, you know, here in this chair next to you? He said, no, no, it's fine. He said, uh, you're Gino, right? That's what they used to call me um, in prison. And I said, yeah. He said, you don't got a lot of respect in this place. I said, what? He said, you know, when you came in the other night, you apologized. The, the, the guy, a lot of people have nicknames in prison. The other guy that I was talking to that I had hung up his phone, his name was Midnight. He said, when you left, he said, all of the guys jumped on midnight and said, look at this guy walked in here and in front of all of us, he apologized. He didn't know any better. And you ripped him apart. You've got to go and apologize to that man. So what could have ended up as a total disaster turned into be a blessing because wow. my reputation was formed right away that I was a stand up guy, that I was going to accept responsibility. And, you know, the littlest things in prison are the biggest things, Stacy. I mean, you know, as I think most people know, respect is like the king there. You better yeah. respect people or you were going to find out what it's like not to respect them. You may not like them, but at least you have to respect them and stay out of their way if you, know, you need or you can. Anyway, it was just one example of how God had my back, that I was just the person that, you know, he told me, you know, you got to go and apologize. And yeah. uh, I did it thinking and actually hoping that I wasn't going to get you know pounded into submission. But yeah. as I say, as time went on, I just found more and more examples of that. But, but what I decided to do when I was in prison, uh, other than write, is I wanted to change my life because I was not going to be able to get back into the business that I was there or that, uh, that had sent me there. So that's what I did. So when I came home years later, I, I, even though I got a 13-year sentence, I was able to get out in nine years which, you know, sounds like, well, nine years, but I, I I couldn't do it again. I mean, it was one day was worse than the next. But the thing is, is when I came home, I thought, how can I help other people? What can I do in my life now that I can't do what I was used to? And yeah. I decided to become a, a life coach. Actually, I had, I had gotten my certification before I went to prison, a couple of years before I did. But I knew I needed to go through and finish whatever was going to go on in my life with this case before I could go out and help others. And that's what I've done up until now. And um, as I mentioned a minute ago, I have a subscription newsletter uh, that I I'll publish every uh, Monday morning, uh, tells what happened in the market the previous week, uh, where people should have their money placed at any particular time. And the thing is, is that uh, we've been doing this now, I've been doing this now for a couple of years. And people kept asking me uh, back in uh, 21 and 22, my God, what's going to, what do you think is going to happen with the market? It's doing so bad. And you really should, you, you, can you help me? And you really should do something. Maybe you can write about it. And the more I thought about it and prayed about it, uh, the more I, I thought, okay, you know, I'll try this. And um, so this particular site, 
uh, I really thought about doing it for people that work at Target or Walmart, or they don't have a lot of money. Because yeah. folks that don't have a lot of money rarely, if ever, hear from their broker. So yeah. I realized that most people that work at a retail outlet, let's say, they don't have the access to a financial advisor. And chances are when they start it there, uh, they put their 401k that they're maybe putting $50 every two weeks away or whatever. Uh, they put it into something when they first started and they've never moved it. And maybe the right. reason that they put it into that fund is because the name sounded nice or you know, this sounds as good as anything else. Well, yeah. here, what they can do is follow what I'm saying to them. And it's a very, very easy English. Uh, and yeah. they can they can track what's going on and they can manage their own money. Um, that website, by the way, is marketwatch.gainwisdom.com. I thought I'd throw that plug in there. But in any event, the thing is, is that uh, it is another way that I tried to help people. And um, as I say, with my coaching, uh, also I do public speaking and uh, to try and really uh, point out to people that the only time you really fail is when you give up, when you stop getting up, then you fail. And I wanted yeah. to be able to show from my experiences that there's no reason to give up. I mean, yeah. and as I say to so many people when I speak to them, if an idiot like me can pick their, themselves up and keep moving forward. And I went to prison and I've got that big F on my forehead. And, you know, I can be written off as, well, he's, he was a crook. He was in jail, you know, whatever. If I can do it and you're not going through that problem, you can do it. And the thing is, is that I've shown that. And I think that, you know, as we talked before we started recording, you know, the, the, the trials and tribulations that each and every one of us go through, and we all go through them. Yeah. We have to learn from them. And, you know, I, I, and I talk about this in Chrysalis, that, you know, when we have difficulties or reversals, we say we go through them. That's right. Yeah. We go through them. We don't stay. We go through it. And I think yeah. that's what's important that people should know. And with every difficulty, and again, this is another one of those things that sounds hokey, but with every difficulty, with every reversal, with every problem, there's yes. a lesson. There's a lesson for all of us, and we can all learn from it if we keep our eyes open and our ears open, because you'll learn a lesson that you wouldn't get. And, you know, everybody, and I was very successful for many, many years, if we want to consider success being money. I was very successful. But what did I learn? It took right. me having a reversal, a, a terrible reversal in my case, to be able to come out of it and say, you know what? I can help somebody avoid that. You know, when I do my, my uh, performance coaching, I tell people that my mission is to take years off of your learning curve. You know, I, I was talking to a gentleman this morning, actually, who's uh, going to become a client. And I said to him, I said, you know, it's very, very easy for me to say, well, we can do it this way or you can do it that way and never have gone through this. Yeah. But I know it works because it worked for me. I know what you're going through. Because I've been through what you've gone through with it, being in the financial business, which is what he is or he's in right now. But the thing is, is that would you rather learn? And I know we talked about this before we started recording. You know, if you had, had to have open heart surgery, would you want to go to the surgeon that just graduated number one in his class at Harvard Medical last year and have him do the surgery? Or would you rather have the guy that's doing that for 30 years? Right. I don't have to answer that question. I think everybody that's listening knows the answer to that. You want to go to the guy that has experience. And that's where I am. I'm the guy that has been there and done that. And it's not doesn't make me a special guy. It just makes me qualified to be able to talk about the, the pitfalls. You know, my dad, for instance, has been gone for many, many years now. Yeah. And it was amazing because my father used to tell me things when he was still here. And, you know, I was, you know, yeah, okay, okay, dad. But man, my father got really smart over the years. He really, really, he did, you know, because he had been through life. And, you know, when you go down the path of life, you see the stop signs. And this is like, you know, on a highway, you see where the curves are because you've been down that road. And when yes. you run into people that, that maybe aren't so nice, that you tend to, especially nice people tend to put that off. But yeah. when you've been through and down that road and through that trial, if you will, you know, you've got that experience to go back on. The Romans, the Romans put it the, the best way, I think, and that is that uh, a wise man learns by the experiences of others, a fool yes. by his own. 
And I try to help people and I do help people to avoid those pitfalls that I did. And, you know, the thing is, is I, I know, again, before we started recording, I had mentioned that had the government said to me, you know, Mr. Gain, you were responsible. This is your company. I would have had a plead right away because they were true. You know, the, the, the captain of the ship is the one that gets in trouble when the, the, the ship runs aground. Remember, you know, about 10, 15 years ago, uh, the Achille Laurel, not the Achille Laurel, um, well, what was the name of that boat in, in uh, Italy? It ran aground. And I forgot the name of it. The Achille Laurel was back in the fifties, I think. But in any event, no, I, I take that back. Now, you know, then I'm thinking this is the the, the there was a terrorist attack in the eighties. That was the name of that boat. Anyway, uh, when this particular uh, cruise ship had hit the ground uh, or became grounded, it wasn't the sailors that got in trouble. It was the captain, and rightly so. So I had the government said to me, you know, Mr. Gain, you were responsible. How do you argue with that? I couldn't. But for them to put their version on that I lied and I instructed my employees, and, and which was ridiculous, and again, passing a, poly, a couple of polygraph tests had proved that, and they still put me away. But, you know, as I, again, before we started recording, I had mentioned to you that on top of my locker, every day of my, my days in prison, I had a scripture verse from Romans 8.28, and people can look this up. But what it says is, all things come together for good to them that love God. And are called according to his purpose. And you know, Stacey, I can attest to that because I've seen what I could do and the people that I could help. And to me, it's a great honor. And even though, as I said before, the people that are in the financial business, it's a sacred trust to help other people. I feel that way now. I feel that it's my mission in life to help people take years off of their learning curve. And as I said to this gentleman this morning, you know, he's going to be successful no matter what. I talked to him and I could tell right away. But I told him, instead of it being five years from now, I can help you get to there within the next year. And that's not hokey. I've done it. I know what to do. I know what he can do. And I know yeah. the things to help him reach that goal. Right. That's amazing. You know, I when your, your story really touches my heart. And I, I gotta say, you know, so many people, when they go through obstacles in life, they become, you know, so angry. They become, you know, um, hopeless, angry. Uh, they just, they just want to give up. You know, they, they, all these things go go through. You know, like I've I've dealt with so many people, and instead of looking on the brighter side, or instead of trying to pull the positive out of the negative, they immediately become angry. Why me? Why did this happen to me? You know, and and they just give up at that point, and they just right. they look. At Life, they look at people in a negative way and they take out their anger on others. You know, mm -hmm. you didn't do that. You did the complete opposite. You know, what provokes you to actually go down that other road, that road where you, you know, you didn't really, you know, fill up with that anger or that pity, you know, why me, why me? And you didn't really take out you know, your anger out on others. You actually, you, you took what was given to you and you, you, and you afterwards, you know, you went and even though it wasn't your fault, you were incarcerated, but you took it with stride and, and you went in there and you did what you had to do. You came out and then you took what you learned and you turned it around to help other people. You know, how did you get to that point where you were able to think in that mentality? The first night I went to prison, Stacey, the, the very first night, and there's a first time for everything as we know in life. Yeah. Um, I, I sat there, I laid there that night in my cube and I was sharing my cube with other people. And I, I remember it was about 1130 at night and I put my shirt that they had given me, I put my shirt over my face and I started crying. And I don't care how many guys think they're tough guys. That first night in prison, you have that. And it just happens. Nobody takes that in stride. Oh, well, here I am for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, life, five years, whatever the case is. Yeah. And I, I, I remember I, w I wasn't sobbing. I wanted to, but you know, I, I can't let everybody hear me. So yeah. I laid there. And you know, Stacy, I swore at God. I said, how could you do this to me? You know, I had had a heart attack a few, a few months after the government first came in, uh, which they came in in May of 08. Um, I was a pretty big boy back then. As a matter of fact, people that see my pictures from back then don't even recognize me. But, you know, when I when I was laying there that night, I called God every filthy name that you could think of. And I'm not kidding about this. I really did. I'm shocked that I didn't get struck dead. And I said, you know, 
you had me. I was dead. I actually died on uh, when I had the heart attack and they brought me back with the paddles. Um, but I said, you had me. You know the truth. It doesn't matter that anybody else in this universe knows the truth. You know the truth. How could you let this happen to me? You rotten, and, and I did. I, I was really bad. And it was the first night, I think, that that I began, I got it off of my chest. You know, when we pray and when we talk to God, we think that we have to get down on our hands and knees. And if that's what works for you, that's what you should do. But the, the, the problem is, is that, you know, we can't beg when we pray. I mean, praying and begging means that you don't think it's going to happen. And maybe another time, if we can get together, I'll talk a lot more about that, because I know we could spend hours talking about this. But the thing is, is that when when we look at, at life and we want something, yeah. generally we're thinking, especially if we want a lot of money or if we want to get a new car or if we want a new home or whatever, if it's important to us, we yeah. as human beings, one of the first reactions or the first thoughts that we have, I'll probably never get it. And, you know, I'm kind of, you know, mixing apples with oranges here, but I want to combine them. And there's a reason I'm saying this, because you talk about being, you know, being negative and trying to turn a negative around. You know, being negative is, is we're predisposed as human beings to be negative. I talk about this at length in Chrysalis. I think a lot of us get down on the fact of, you know, that we're, our thoughts go dark or all oh, this will never work or whatever. As human beings, we're predisposed to thinking that way because it's genetically imparted to us. When the human species started, however long, I mean, depending on what your point of view is, but I believe it's over 100,000 years ago, uh, when the human human race started, you weren't going to be Mr. Positive sitting up in your tree or in your cave or wherever you were when you started to see the, you know, the grass parting coming towards you or the twigs you know, breaking under somebody's feet. You know, you weren't going to sit there and welcome because it could be a predator of some sort, whether it's another human being or an animal. You would have to always be on edge because, you know, people obviously didn't live that long back then. But the thing is, while you were alive, th that's what saved us as a human as a human race is being negative because, mm -hmm. you know, it's the same thing that was implanted in our brain. It's, it's called the hippocampus. And again, I talk about these things in the book. But, you know, if you're walking down the street, and we hear all kinds of noise. We hear cars going by and the bus and, you know, people talking and all of these th things. But when you hear a car screech to a halt, we yes. immediately, we, we hear that. And the thing is, what happens is it goes back into our brain that something is wrong. Something is amiss. Yes. Those are the things that are implanted in us. We have to have a way to overcome our negativity. We have to have a way to be able to go beyond, you know, thinking, well, this is never going to work. And, you know, when people talk about faith, you know, they it, it seemed to, to, it's been mixed up, unfortunately, the word faith. Well, I'm of the Catholic faith, or I'm Greek Orthodox faith, or I'm Protestant faith. That's not what it is. Those are denominations. Those are religions. What faith is, is believing in something that you can't see. You know, the thing is, is that over and over, as I mentioned earlier, where Jesus in the Bible keeps talking about having faith and not doubting and believing. Over and over, he talks about that. And, you know, I, I've talked to people about, you know, in the book, again, I, I mentioned this, that when Jesus went to Nazareth, and it's, this is in Luke, but when Jesus went to Nazareth, he really was amazed as he walked out of town that he wasn't able to heal a lot of people. And, 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 and the reason is, is that the people in that town said, wait a minute, this is the guy that used to live with us? You know, his brothers and sisters live with us? This is in the Bible. You know, who is this guy? Who does he think he is? I mean, we can almost hear the negativity. Yeah. But the thing is, is that people have to believe. And Jesus over and over talks about that. So the thing is, is the people in Nazareth, the majority of people didn't believe he could do what he could do, even yeah. though there had been all kinds of miracles and they had certainly heard about that in the past. So again, I think that to overcome negativity, to overcome, you know, where we normally will think, I think we need to be, be in prayer. And I know I'm not talking about that prayer that we get down on our hands and knees. But again, as I said before, if that's what helps a person, then certainly do that. But prayer is talking to God. It's as if we're talking to our parent, our, our, our father. You know, hey, Dad, could you help me with this or that? And I know it's so uncommon to do and a little kind of weird almost. Like, I can't talk to God like that. Why? You know, there's a part in the Bible that talks about that he who is in love, God is love. And he who loves God is in him, in him and, and, and you and God. 
you know, we're part of that spark. God is with us. He's omnipresent. He's around. That's all we need to do is to call on him. And, you know, yeah. I know we can, again, you know, keep going on and on, but I do want to share a quick story, another quick story, if I could. Mm -hmm. Years ago, on 60 Minutes, there was a story uh, or a program, excuse me, uh, about Mount Athos. Now, maybe you personally might be familiar with Mount Athos. This is in Greece. And uh, Mount Athos is uh, a peninsula up in northern Greece that um, uh, there are 20 monasteries there, uh, Greek Orthodox monasteries. And I happened to watch this program. It, it, it first aired on uh, 60 Minutes, as I said, back on April, or excuse me, on Easter Sunday uh, of 2011. People can look at this online. I go to YouTube and put Mount Athos in there and it'll come up. But, you know, as I watched this particular uh, program, and this is a couple of months before I'm going to go to prison, and I knew at that point I'd already planned and I, I knew I was going to go. Uh, and, and, I, and I watched this. And there was a particular um, um, uh, priest that was from the United States that uh, uh, Bob Simon was the um, uh, journalist. And he interviewed mm -hmm. him and some other folks. But he asked this priest from Boston, actually, uh, who was Greek and had decided this was the life he wanted to lead. Uh, lead excuse me. Um, he said something about praying. He said, well, you know, we, we pray here all the time. And they have a, a prayer on Mount Athos called the Jesus Prayer. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. And when I watched it, I thought, you know, it's kind of strange because this priest from Boston, uh, who is now in Mount Athos and has been a, an Orthodox priest for many years, said when, when he was asked, he, Bob Simon said, well, are you praying now? And this priest said, well, what makes you think I'm not? And I didn't understand it at the time, mm -hmm. but I do now. Because it's my faith in God that got yeah. me through going through prison. And, you know, even though we're talking right now and we're, you know, interviewing right now, I'm still in prayer. And I don't say that because I'm some special guy. Any of us can do this. Yes. But, you know, when I, would, when I would walk across the yard in prison, I would say that Jesus prayer. I would, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. And I know, again, I know it sounds hokey. But I challenge and encourage the viewers and the listeners to do that. If you want to have an impact on your life, if you want to come uh, overcome negativity, if you want to overcome the, the problems in your life, and I'm not going to get emotional about it, which I could right now, but that will do it. I'm telling you it will do it. Just try it. If you don't believe me, just, just try it. Try it for a couple of days. It'll work. Because the yeah. thing is, is that... Whether you believe in God or not, I don't mean you, Stacey, I'm talking a viewer or a listener. Whether you believe in God or not, he believes in you. And he'll always be there for you. And I'm a testament to being able to get through something that was very, very difficult to do. Yeah, very difficult to do. You took a, a, an amazing you know, something, something that happened to you, you, you just turned it around. And it's amazing how, you know, your, your story, your life has changed so many other lives because of you, because of one event that you went through, you were able to overcome it, you were able to survive, and now you're you're helping millions of people, you know, whether you realize it or not. And we talked about that too before, you know, uh, you know, one person's story can change millions of lives, right. you know, and just by listening to you, by talking to you, you, you've you touched my life in so many ways. And I can hear your sincerity. I can hear your love just piercing through just by the way you speak. And it's it's just amazing, you know, um, what you've been through and, and how you use it today to help so many other people. It's remarkable. It really is. Now, if, if you want to take what we spoke about today and you wanted to really emphasize on some important turning points for people, what would you like to emphasize that people understand? And maybe they could use this to incorporate in their lives to help themselves, you know, get to the point of life where they want to be. Right. Well, again, if, uh, if you're looking for someone to really guide you along life, uh, I can do that. I do do that, you know, for my clients. I only work with 12 people a year. I'm very busy with some of the other things that I do, and I want to make sure that I concentrate and focus on those people that I'm working with. Uh, I work with them an hour a month. Uh, I ask them to send me an email every week and let me know how things are going. Um, if they have problems, they can also always reach out to me. But I work with them for a year in my coaching business. 
And um, not only do I give them ideas as to what worked for me, but I'm there. You know, a, a lot of problems I said, also picking on this poor guy that I spoke with this morning, uh, he had come to me actually through LinkedIn. And, you know, unfortunately in LinkedIn, it's gotten to the point where there's so many people selling so many things on there, over-promising and under-delivering. And I'm not saying every single person is like that or every company, but it's gotten to be almost like uh, uh, used to be a, a years ago with something called the swap sheet that you could sell anything on there. And uh, it's almost gotten like that. So, you know, what makes me different? You know, when, when I talk to people, they'll tell, I talked to a lady last week. She said, you know, I spent so much money, you know, the, the, the people told me they could help me and they didn't. And I said, the help that I give you, and I'm coaching you, whatever happens, whatever success happens, whatever success comes of our relationship is going to come from you. Because I demand people are disciplined. I demand people really focus on a foundation. So I'm able to touch people in a way, if they make that commitment to themselves, not to me, if they make that commitment to themselves, we're going to do some great things. Because I'm going to show you what worked for me and what I actually did. But I've got a couple of different websites. My, my, my main website is called gainwisdom.com. That's G-A-N-E wisdom.com. Um, I also didn't want people to go through the, the prison process the way I did. And uh, walking in, as I mentioned earlier, not knowing a thing about what to do, about what to look at in prison. What should I expect? So I partnered with the Christian community nationwide. And I started uh, an organization called Prison Ecology. That's P R I S O, P R I S O N C O L O G Y, prisoncology.com. Before I went to prison, uh, I had been referred to a prison consultant. Now, remember, Stacy, I was completely broke. My family, we had no money. They took everything. Yeah. My wife and I and, and, and the kids, we were going to the soup kitchens. And I mean that. I mean, we just didn't have anything. We put groceries back because we couldn't afford it. This girl went to went to uh, food pantries to get uh, to get us food. So I knew what it was like not to have anything. But right. the thing is, is that I didn't want people to have to go through what I did because awesome. we ended up getting the money together for a prison consultant. My family, extended family, people that I, I really kind of knew but didn't really know all that well, we threw money together and gave this guy $5,000. Because he had told me he could prevent me maybe from going to prison. I uh, could, you know, maybe shorten my time. Made all of these promises. And like the drowning man, I was grasping at anything I could. Because now I'm just months away. I hadn't heard from him. We'd sent him the money. And I hadn't heard from him in a couple of months, or a couple of weeks, excuse me. And so I called him up. I said, you know, when are we going to get going? I was really excited. And he said, well, he said, what we're going to do is I'm going to put together a letter campaign and send these letters to the judge. Well, I, I've already done that. The judge has already got my letters. Well, what else are we going to do? Well, that's pretty much all I can do. I said, well, wait a minute. What about all the stuff you told me before? Well, you're dealing with the federal government and they're a little tough to deal with, but uh, that's about all I can do. I, I really can't do anymore. Well, my wife was livid because 5000 at that time was $5 million, really. Right. And um, uh, she called him up and she said, we want our money back. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't give refunds. He basically stole the money. I don't yeah. care what it was. But, you know, the thing is, is that when I started prison ecology, it was with that in mind. I did not want people to have to go through that, that I did. So yes. when we deal, I have a board of directors that are all over the country. Um, some of them have been incarcerated. Uh, some of them are uh, law enforcement. Uh, I have a, a prison warden that is retired now from Texas. I have right. uh, people in, in the West Coast, the East Coast, the middle of the country, but the thing is, is that uh, what we do is we talk to people that are going to prison and help their families as well. And there's no charge. There's no cost at all because we want to help them. I want to make sure that that person that, that that's facing what I did doesn't have to go through what I did. And, you know, I tell people, if you go to a, a prison consultant, if you or someone that you love or someone that you know is going to prison and they want to talk to a prison consultant, by all means, you should do that. But when that person tells you they can do whatever they say they can do, ask yeah. them two things. And I'm so serious about them. Ask them two things. First of all, would you put that in writing? And number two, would you would you sign it? Mm -hmm. And if, if if they do that, I, I really, I would appreciate an email because I've never heard anybody that will do that. Because yeah. if you're going to tell people something, back it up with your word. Yes. I back up what I do. I back up with what I say. 
the mm -hmm. thing is, is that, you know, uh, that again, if you know anybody, if, if, if the viewers or the listeners know anybody that's going through that time, uh, you know, certainly reach out to us. My story, actually, my full story uh, about what happened is, is there as well. And there's a lot of pertinent information. Um, with my other sites, as I said, you know, with my financial site, that again is marketwatch.gainwisdom.com. And my uh, my main website is gainwisdom.com. But, you know, the thing is, is that what I tried to do with my life to, by turning it into uh, the, what I considered the negative into the positive was to yeah. try to help other people. And I, I hope I can, I'm able to do that. I hope I've been able to do that. I hope I'm able to continue to do that as well. Well, you've definitely touched my heart today. And uh, thank you. You know, you don't have to have a, you, you could have a story and you don't have to go exactly through what they went through, but just, you know, just, just the, you know, how, you know, you, you used religion and faith, you know, not religion, let's nix that. You used your faith to get you through your, what your, 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 your the hardships that you went through. Right. You positive you took a situation you overcame the obstacles and then you turned it into something positive and you're helping people now you know and just your sincerity and, and the love that pierces through when you speak you know it just you know it it inspires others it inspired me today you know to be able to to go through so much in life and to be able to to overcome it and then be able to help so many people you know it, it's truly a gift it's a gift and it's, you know, and I think everybody has a gift. It's just being able to find that gift within. Right. And, you know, I think we all go through things in life for a reason. I think everything happens in life for a reason. It's mm -hmm. figuring out the why. And then, you know, once you figure out why, then turning that into an action, a call right. to action. Right. And then really looking at how can I help others, not just myself, you know. Mm -hmm. Everybody could just reach out and help one person. Imagine how wonderful the world could be. Absolutely. That's so true. That's so true. You know, there was a movie you might remember years ago, uh, Pay It Forward. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, but it was a great movie. If, you, if people haven't seen it, they, they really should watch it. And it was the story about a little boy who decided as part of a class project to help. His idea was to help three people. And in order to help those three people, or and, and I should say as a, as a payback, if you will, to help those yeah. three people, those three people needed to reach out to three people and help yeah. them in some way. And they had to reach out to three people. That was the whole idea about pay it forward. And I really think that we're called to action to do that with people. Yes, we get caught up in our own lives. You know, so many things come up. But, you know, when people would, when I've said, you know, a few times here how successful I was, you know, everybody needs money in their life. You need to be able to pay your bills. There's nothing angelic about sending your child to school because you can't give them a lunch or holes in their shoes. You know, th th this fallacy about, uh, you know, that uh, God favors the poor and such, it's a misinterpretation of Bible of the Bible, excuse me. Uh, one of them is that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. And when we hear those type of things, we seem to think that, well, it's, it, poverty is a virtue. It's not. It's not a virtue. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you make money your idol, however. You know, we've all heard that story that money's the root of all evil. That's not what it says. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil because a lot of people will make money their idol and that we can't do. God, in the Ten Commandments, you know, don't yeah. put another God before me. But the thing is, is I think that what's important for people to know is that when they're helping somebody else, they're really helping themselves. And, you know, the people that lied about me, the people, you know, and Stacy, when all of this happened, I was spit at, literally spit at. People spit at me and 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 pushed me around. And I took it. I was such a beaten animal, a guy who had been so confident all of his life, you know, and I took all of that because I was beaten down so bad emotionally and, and mentally and physically yeah. as well. But you know, the thing is is that what I was able to do is to be able to look back at that time and it made me into a stronger person. And, you know, I look at, at the way things have worked out in my life now. When I came home, I came home to nothing. You know, my wife and I had gotten divorced. She had had a nervous breakdown and we broke up about a year and a half after I was in prison. And when I came home, I, I, I went to live with my son and his family. But I was blessed to be able to do that because I get to meet my granddaughters and spend time with them that most grandparents today, you know, it's not like years ago, I'm Italian, as we talked about before. 
you know, where grandpa and grandpa were, uh, you know, were always around the house. You know, I was blessed to be able to do that. But the point I want to make before we part is success is not money. When we close our eyes for the last time, I promise you that as you're laying in that bed, you're not saying, you know, how much is, is uh, in my account? What kind of interest rate did I get? How did the market do today? There's only one thing. There's only one thing that matters in all of our lives. And this is what success is. And that's love. If you yeah. have love in your life, your success. To me, success is putting my head down at my pillow at night and knowing somebody out there loves me. That's success. So keep that in mind. You know, when, when people think about, well, I want this and I want that, certainly have goals. Absolutely. I have them. All of us do. But just yeah. know, never give up, but never stop loving. No matter what life throws at you, never stop loving. And if you do, come right back to it. Get mad, you know, let it out. But don't forget, the fact is, is that, you know, love is what matters. Love is what goes through our lives. And love is what 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 outlasts us all. It's yes. the love that people remember from us. And you'll never die if that's the case. I love it. Oh, this has been amazing, Guy. I now where can people find your books if they want to purchase your books? Yeah, they could they could write to me. I can send them myself. It's a guy at gainwisdom.com. Uh, that's my email address. Or you can go to Amazon. All three of my books are Chrysalis, uh, in uh, uh, Unchained and Unbroken, and uh, Manage Money. All three of them are available on Amazon. But again, if you'd like, uh, you can you know just write to me. Also, I, I do want to mention, Stacey, that uh, the first 10 people that, if they're interested, uh, if they uh, email me, I'll send them uh, Manage Money uh, for free. I'll just send that out to them. I do that for the first 10 people. And also, for any of the folks that decide that are, are watching today or listening today, if they buy any, uh, any of the books, uh, I do donate 15% uh, back to you. I do this with anybody that I do a podcast with. And that's, you know, you can donate it to charity. You can do whatever you want with it. But the the, the people that are listening that do buy, um, they, uh, they are helping you as well because you are going to get money back for that. That's just my way of giving back, saying thank you. Well, thank you. I, this has been amazing. I, I really appreciate this. You know, you, you have done, you have given a whirlwind advice. You have, you know, you you came out and you create, you were courageous enough to tell your story. And that's not easy for a lot of people. A lot of people have difficulty telling their story and you, you've given so much knowledge today and, and so much, you know, direction and hope. And, you know, you really shared the, the importance of, of faith and, and moving forward in life and overcoming your obstacles and, and really giving back and, and, you know, having that gratitude as we, we spoke, you know, earlier in the day, but I just want to say, thank you for coming on the show. Thank this you for having me. Amazing. Thank you so much. And I hope you'll come back and we can talk some more because this has been an, an amazing moment. Thank you. Thank you. You have a great day. You too. Thank you so much. God bless you all. God bless you.